Stories Bigger Than Texas, The Alamo Podcast. The Alamo is for everyone. We are committed to making the historic site accessible, whatever your needs. Today, we reveal the steps the Alamo's taken to provide sensory-friendly experiences, the accessible tours the Alamo can offer as you plan your visit, and the work being done to make an Alamo for all. I'm your host, Emily Baucom. Our episode begins today with Angela Wolfgram, the Alamo's Director of Living History and Public Programs. Angela, you are tasked with making sure the phrase Alamo for all is more than a feel-good idea. It's a reality. What does this mission mean to you? Yes, so thank you so much for having me to talk about this. I will preface what I'm going to say with um, the fact that I approach the topic of accessibility, inclusion, Um, with like a humility, knowing that I am still learning and I'm enjoying learning and this institution is enjoying learning about how to improve in this process. So uh, an Alamo for all, in my mind, means that we are doing all we can to make sure that we are removing barriers um, for folks of all backgrounds, all ability levels, Um, All sensory needs to have a good visit. A good visit could mean a lot of things, but as long as they feel like they belong at the Alamo and um, we've done everything we can to make them feel welcome, then I feel as though we've been successful. The Alamo has partnered with a national group called Culture City. What is Culture City and what does it mean to become certified by it? Culture City is a really neat nonprofit um, based in Alabama, right outside of Birmingham. Their mission is to basically make sure that um, venues across the country, and these could be sporting arenas, museums like ours, zoos, all sorts of um, venues are inclusive, that they are providing environments and resources for um, everyone to have a successful visit. And so we got connected up with them kind of towards the end of 2021. Uh, and ever since then, we've been in an ongoing process really of certification. So you do certification each year, and that means that you work with Culture City um, to go through training for staff. So Every that, single staff member at the Alamo goes through this training. Yes, yes. So th- that is correct. Uh, we are learning about... Uh, different types of sensory needs, and even the fact that it's not just five senses, it's actually eight senses. And there are just a lot of ways that people experience their environment and process their environment. And so staff goes through this training, um, which we did, and then uh, we will receive a number of items from Culture City to make sure that our venue is uh, sensory inclusive. So we received um, lots of different types of signs, and we um, have bilingual signs, which is great. And these signs indicate that we are a sensory inclusive environment working with Culture City, uh, that we have sensory bags, which I'll get into in a moment, uh, and that we have areas that we've designated as uh, headphone zones or quiet areas. Quiet areas are spots we set aside to say, hey, if you are um, getting overloaded in any way, just need a moment to process, a moment to yourself, well, you'll never be completely alone with the Alamo because it's always so um, busy. But we're saying this is a spot where you can kind of decompress. Um, and headphone zones are spots where we're saying this is a louder environment. If that is something that uh, might affect you in a certain way, we're just giving you a heads up um, so you can be prepared. Um, so connected with that, we have sensory bags that folks can um, check out for completely free. We want this all to be free. Uh, and these bags include fidget toys. Uh, they include noise-canceling headphones, um, cards that you can point to that indicate Um, just what you're feeling at that moment, if you have a need. Uh, There's a lanyard that's in there as well that says um, Culture City uh, VIP, just so folks are also aware on staff that you're utilizing that bag. And then a neat drawstring bag that you can easily wear on your back or someone in your visiting group can wear. And so we have these at the Welcome Center. Uh, We want folks to utilize them and folks do utilize them. And so this is um, all part of an ongoing process for us to figure out 
what resources we would like to have on site. And it's really just the beginning, but we've been very grateful to partner with Culture City to do this. You have helped spearhead sensory-friendly evenings at the Alamo. Describe those experiences for us and what it takes to plan them. We start by making it a ticketed event. Um, and that is, it's a free event, but we want to keep the numbers of people visiting down lower than usual, just because we know that the Alamo can have a lot of people at any given time. And that's just a lot for um, anyone, let alone someone who might be processing sensory needs differently. And so uh, we make sure we adjust the number of attendants. We, um, if we're able, it's tricky in some of the older buildings, try to adjust light levels, try to adjust sound levels. Um, we also have tactile activities um, for uh, people to enjoy. And this most recent time, in fact, we were kind of prototyping with our archaeologist, um, Dr. Tiffany Lindley, kind of a hands-on excavation activity. So that's for those sensory seekers who really want to get in there um, and use their hands and have a tactile experience. One in six people, I get this from Culture City, um, one in six in the U.S. have um, a sensory processing uh, need or, or a sensory processing, something that they're working through. And so it's really vital to be a good community member, to um, be a good citizen of the world, um, to be just a, a friend of the community, um, to be thinking about these evenings. But beyond these evenings, um, just trying to integrate some of these principles for everyday visits. Angela, stay with us. Let's bring in Tom Castanos, who's the Alamos Director of Interpretation. Tom, you help oversee so many of the tours that take place, guided tours, audio tours, even private tours. And with advance notice, you can curate an accessible tour. What does that mean? Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me. The great thing about interpretation versus doing a, 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 just a, a, a rote program, something that's been written that you recite, is that we instill a great deal of information in our, our tour providers then they, in turn, as the name implies, interpret that information to the crowd. And that can be everything from finding uh, the most historically appropriate story for a crowd, knowing your audience, to finding all the necessary ways to help people understand and take in the information, whether it be for people that have visual impairment, a more tactile experience. I've worked with Angela's staff before in Living History where they can get out and touch and feel things. Maybe it is an event that's in a, a more dimly lit environment. The key is being aware of your audience and knowing what they need. With the staff being well-versed in the topic, then that leaves them the creativity and flexibility to provide the information in a method, in a way that's uh, available to all. If people know they're coming to the Alamo and need an ASL interpreter or would like a tactile tour, that is something that you can provide. Absolutely. With, with a little bit of notice, because you know it is a little outside of our standard operating, we can do that because this is something, uh, like Angela said, it, it should be everyone's goal to make sure that everyone can leave here with an experience that's meaningful and useful. Um, so taking the information that we have and then with Culture City information and other personal experiences that we have on staff, we can tailor that to meet their needs. Mobility is also an access concern, but you can get wheelchairs for people. Absolutely. We have wheelchairs available on site. Sadly, historic buildings aren't necessarily always accessible. So even in an instance where an area may not be accessible, we'll always try and have imagery or photos or explanations of the things that wouldn't be accessible. A modern building legally has to be. These old historic buildings don't. So we always try and have an alternative available. How do you approach these accessible tours? Because the history is the same, but the approach may be slightly different. 100%. And, and much like when, you, when you're when you in teaching, you understand that people take in information different ways. Uh, teachers are taught that you have uh, tactile learners, and you have audio learners, you have those that visually and take in the information. Well, it's taking that same set and expanding it just a little bit farther for people that might struggle with one of those kinds of ways. So when you, when you think about a program, you, you have this information, and then your next step is, well, how would I give this to someone who might not hear my presentation? What kind of visual aids can I have to help 
tell this story? If someone um, is visually impaired, how can I create a, a, a narrative that will help create an image in their mind of the things that they may not be able to see? I take a great deal of pride that we have a wonderful creative staff uh, many who have had experience in performing arts that have that ability to go beyond just reciting a story. They can, they can really bring it to life in whatever way we need to. How much advance notice do you need? What's the suggested protocol for setting up an accessible tour? I would say if, if you can do two weeks, that would be great. We, we can probably do it a little sooner, but let's stick with two weeks for now. I think that would be helpful. How do these tours personally impact you? I imagine they touch you in unexpected ways. So I was raised by a mother who, who was afflicted by polio as a child. And I remember us going as, as, a, as a young person to theme parks like Astroworld, the long gone Astroworld in Houston, Texas. And this was in an era long before there was any real push to make things accessible. And, and she could walk, but not well. And I remember individuals at those places could make an amazing difference about, you know, letting her move to the front of the line so she wasn't stampeded by the crowd because she couldn't move as quickly. And these were people that were taking it on their own initiative because, again, it, it wasn't commonplace at the time. So it became very obvious what just a few people could do to make uh, an experience better for someone. And I think if you kind of take that attitude, you can do some great things. Well, thank you for sharing that personal story. Oh, my pleasure. Joining our conversation now is Paul Anderson, a guest experience associate. Paul, how long have you worked at the Alamo? Well, thank you for having me here today. I started in October. Paul, you do have a hearing impairment. Can you please describe it for us and how long you've been living with it? I was very young uh, when I was notified that I had a hearing impairment. I have a bilateral, which means both ears, hearing loss. And so growing up in the 50s and 60s, even the 70s, there was not the technology available to help me to hear uh, well. Your love for the Alamo runs very deep. What got you into the history, the story? Well, uh, I was born March the 6th. Wow, <laughs> yeah. big day around here. <laughs> it was a big day around my family, too. Uh, I remember uh, one of the greatest influences of my life was the John Wayne Alamo movie. And then later I got the, for Christmas, I got an Alamo uh, playset for Christmas. And so I got to play with that. And one of the biggest things that really influenced me was on my sixth, on my, it was March the 5th, we came from Lubbock to San Antonio. And typically I didn't have any idea where we were going when we were traveling. So I would just take the paper bag and put all my toys and all my goodies <laughs> in this bag and just go with my parents. We had a big car, so I'd put it in the back seat and, and just play with my toys until we got to our destination. And, and this time, we came to San Antonio. And so we stayed in the hotel, and, and we got up early the next morning. I was really frustrated because I was wondering why are we getting up so early? And we went and had breakfast, and the next thing you know, we're walking in front of the Alamo. And I'd never seen it before. And it, just the sight of it, just, you know, it brought tears to my eyes because I loved the story about the Alamo. And so uh, we were seated in two sections, and uh, I was looking around, waiting to see what was going to happen. All of a sudden, I felt the boom. And all of a sudden, the Mexican army comes in from behind it, and the defenders come from the front, and, and they fire their muskets, and then the, the attack happens, and all the defenders are dead. And I was very sad about that. I was really not happy about that. And I remember looking at my mom, telling her that if the defenders had not been firing in the air, they would have won. <laughs> This is a very vivid memory of the reenactment. Yeah. And all these years later, you've worked here over the years. I know several months ago, some of our historians brought you out of retirement. Yes. You do have a cochlear implant. Yes. I have a cochlear implant. And I've had it, I got it on my 50th birthday. I got the one on my left side on my 50th birthday. Big thing happened on my birthday. Huh? I'm getting that pattern. <laughs> yeah. You've had visitors at the Alamo notice it and even seek you out because of it. Uh, yes, they did. Uh, I've had many people uh, put me to the side and say, 
uh, they have a grandson, they have a nephew, they have a son, they have a child. I'm thinking of getting a cochlear implant. And so, I, you know, I move away from the Alamo story and talk about the implant. And it is a wonderful, wonderful thing. I mean, it has changed my life tremendously. What does it mean to you to help everyone fully appreciate the Alamo? Is there a moment that sticks out? Wow. Uh, Well, I get really excited when I see deaf kids come around. And the other day we had a a group of kids from a local, well, from a nearby deaf school. And uh, I was told there was somebody out front signing and nobody knew what to do. So I went out the front door, got outside and Everybody looking at me, and I was like, "What's happening?" And uh, one of our associates said they need a ticket to get in. And those that were deaf didn't realize they had to have a ticket to get inside the church. It's so, a free ticket, such a small thing, yeah. but you broke down that barrier. Yes, I did, and just told them how to get it done. And uh, within a few minutes, they were in the church, and uh, I was able to uh, sign with them about the history of the church. And then I pulled back. This is one of the most fascinating moment. I pulled back to the back, and one of our uh, uh, interpreters, John, was back in the back, and so I just pulled him in, and I told him, you just talk, and I, I sign. And so he did, and the kids would get totally engaged. And we were so wound up, and uh, the teacher was so excited, and uh, it was just a, a wonderful moment. Representation matters. What do you think it meant to those kids to see someone uh, like them represented? I'm glad you mentioned that. One of the things that really makes the difference is visibility and representation. The fact that one of the kids, he noticed that I, he said, you deaf you work here, that's in ASL. And I said, yes, I work here. And he was so excited, he he had never realized that that was a possibility. You opened that door for him. Oh, it opened the door for me, I mean. Look at what you know, the Alamo has done for me. They help to facilitate change in other people to enjoy this iconic landmark. What's your advice to anyone visiting who has accessibility needs? Definitely notify the office uh, at least a couple of weeks ahead because everyone has a different challenge. And so you may need um, an interpreter or you may need to utilize uh, assistive hearing devices. And so those are things that we have to uh, prepare in advance. Uh, you just can't arrive and hope that it happens. Your experience will not be as good as you want. So definitely uh, plan ahead. This question is for all of you. The Alamo plan construction is well underway. Anyone who visits the site is navigating it. What are the conversations right now to keep accessibility top of mind and truly keep that Alamo for all mindset? Well, I know a few things that have been part of the discussion, um, particularly out on the grounds itself, is just clearly labeled areas, clear signage, so that everyone has visual cues if um, they're more of a visual learner uh, and just kind of more, I would say, organization to the layers of history that are out there. So I really think that's going to be beneficial for everyone and make um, the information more accessible for everyone. Um, One thing that is always discussed with my department, Living History and Public Programs, is just making sure that we have designated areas, particularly for our activities that are a little bit Um, noisier, um, a little bit rowdier, just messier. Uh, One thing in particular is um, figuring out a spot for our weekly musket firing demonstrations. Um, Something that we've experienced in the past is I'll have uh, someone come up to me after a demonstration. I've had people call me and say, listen, I was with an individual who got upset. They didn't know the demo was going to happen and they wanted to leave. And that You just don't want that to happen. So figuring out ways as we design spaces around the site, but even, you know, just ways to um, have uh, warnings ahead of time. Um, I mean, we're just trying to think through all of the different um, layers to that. I'm excited that as living history becomes more incorporated into the fabric of the site, um, we'll be able to then better facilitate 
different types of activities for different types of learners, different types of sensory exploration, but then also um, giving people a heads up about our activities as well. Kind of to expand on that as we capture that footprint of the original mission or, or fortress compound and even a little bit beyond, you know, we're never going to be a quiet, tranquil place. This is not, you know... A, it's downtown San Antonio. It's downtown San Antonio. I think there is going to be a, a level, and, and take this with a grain of salt, tranquility, or a little bit of a, a more relaxed environment as we yeah. capture that larger footprint. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to help everyone kind of find their place, like, like you said. I very much look forward to kind of ex expanding our boundaries so that we can control the areas a little bit more and make something for everyone. Yes, absolutely. Oh, I love this place. I definitely recommend anyone, everyone, anywhere to come and visit this iconic place. Angela Wolfgram, Tom Costanos, and Paul Anderson, thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to check out the podcast notes. We've linked to the page on the Alamo's website with visiting tips for accessibility. The email address I'm about to read is on that page, but be sure to write it down, tours at the Alamo.org. Again, tours at the Alamo.org. That's who you would email to set up any access needs to make your visit to the Alamo seamless. You've been listening to Stories Bigger Than Texas, the Alamo podcast. <laughs>